Hey, I picked up on Marshall Rosenberg's um, non-violent communication, uh, one of his um, performances, so to speak, that um, we have this amazing ability to be a blessing. You know, we have this amazing opportunity to bring life into people's lives. <laughs> bring hope, bring joy, bring assurance, bring the love of God. Astonishing opportunity, the words of our mouth, the things we do, the way we listen, it's not just what we say, is it? It's, it's giving them our attention and earnestly empathizing with them. You know, to know what they're feeling, what's important to them. Um, we've got this amazing inbuilt natural capacity. Um, we may have crowded it out, as he argues, by um, the culture we live in and uh, its authoritarian, judgmental, um, uh, what I would say, legalism, control structure, uh, what he would call um, jackal um, speech and so on, instead of giraffe speech. And uh, he would say, and does, I think, did, that giraffe um, language is uh, the way we can bless and communicate um, celebrate life, celebrate the goodness of life in others and help them blossom and flourish and uh, thereby blossom and flourish ourselves. Absolutely lovely. What an insight. I can't understand why he appears so serious and unsmiling and I mean, he does have the odd uh, whisper of smile that goes across his face, but um, perhaps he deals with so many serious, perhaps he empathizes so much with so many people with difficulties that come to him and organizations that need his help, that it is very sobering and flattening. I sort of feel a bit like listening to Krishnamurti, my goodness, this man needs joy. Oh, he desperately needs joy. And I can't understand why they haven't got it, but they have such good motivation. Um, I think it might be, you know, they haven't actually attended to whatsoever is good and lovely think on these things. They've mastered how to deal with things that were not good and lovely, the problems of living. And it's made them very serious. And uh, I would like to rescue such people from such, um, such a situation. You know, the Christian scripture, do the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's misunderstood, I think it actually means, well, it, 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 there's an ambiguity. Is it God's joy in us, or God's joy that is our strength, or is it that it's our joy in the Lord, the fact that we rejoice to know him and think of him, God, our Heavenly Father, and his presence and his kindness. Is it that which gives us our strength? And, um, well, it's probably both, isn't it? Um, but joy is, uh, um, well, most important. And uh, when you come across people that don't seem to be displaying, exhibiting, showing joy very much at all, there's a certain... Um, 
concern uh, for them and even about them. Um, why aren't they enjoying what's what's going on here? And I think uh, certainly in the case of Marshall Rosenborn, Rosenberg, is it? Yeah. Um, he uh, he could well be just dragged down by the sheer preoccupation with and empathising with um, the tragedies of not celebrating life that he comes across everywhere, <laughs> as he probably feels. Um, it's a bit like um, the religious, you know, the Christian fundamentalists who get so obsessed with um, the evils in the world that um, they don't seem to experience too much joy and hope either. Their hope is more in a rather severe judgment in the end. Um, <laughs> no, what I see is terribly hopeful at all. Um, yeah. Well, that's not where I started though, is it, on this thing? Let me just review a sec. Yes, right. I think I've got it. It's that um, we have this amazing opportunity to bring joy and the love of God and goodness into people's lives simply by the way we talk and the way we listen. Um, allowing our good intent to bless others. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Perhaps I should say, though, that um, it's not just picking up on people's perceived needs as they see it, but as you see it. You know, they may feel, oh, they just need a good permanent relationship. Someone who loves them and is Faithful and true, yes. Where do you think you're going to find it? <laughs> and if you do, that's going to be negative, but they could still die on you, couldn't they? Or change their mind. You know, people do do U-turns for explicable and sometimes inexplicable reasons. Don't you see, it's the solution you're looking for is actually in the wrong place. And if you're not careful, you can join them in this instead of what you know, which is, look, your only assurity and, and, and integrity ultimately turns on God. And it's very hard for me to be faithful and true if I don't feel God is faithful and true to me. Or if I don't think of God at all. You know, it's just, uh, just never been a subject for me. So... I don't know about Marshall Rosenberg's um, beliefs, other than the fact he's got a very powerful book there that doesn't mention God. And then suddenly I feel I know why he's not smiling and happy. Because he's bogged down with the reality of a world that has all sorts of problems and there are answers to them but it's not easy to get people to understand how best to handle these difficulties and they get swamped by it. So I now have to, and I'm still doing it, it's just a couple of years later I'm adding this comment now these last few minutes. I'm still reading his book from the library. I don't mean that I've had it out all this time. 
but I've had it out a dozen times, possibly not quite that many times, but a lot. And um, certainly I've had it out six times recently. But five. No, I think six. <laughs> you know, the month at a time. Well, of course, I've not been continuously reading it all that time. In fact, most of the time I've spent, as you know, on recording and so on. But it's got a lot of good stuff in there. But I have to understand it in terms of In some sense, possibly he wasn't orientated right himself. Very good man in many ways, don't get me wrong, I'm greatly impressed. And I think some of his work was uh, astonishing achievements. You know, he's a great negotiator and bless, bless his people in that way. But, needs to know God. He could be hiding it very well, of course, but I don't think so. I think he just didn't really know that he knows God. He may have thought that he really didn't know God, but did in a way. In other words, he knew what God would be like if God existed, but not much hope of that looking around the world, you know. Very much then Krishnamurti, as, as I mentioned in my couple of years ago in this recording. A great philosopher, not a great saint. And it's not their fault that they're not great saints. It's that they haven't somehow come to it. It hasn't been that that dimension hasn't been presented in a way that has been acceptable to them. So it's not there. And if it's not there, there isn't the assurance, the hope, the trust. It's not that they don't know what love is. And in their way, they are loving but it's not fueled by the love of God to them. The love of God is still there, but of course they're not s conscious of such. They're just conscious of, well, in many ways, a very inadequate world. Whereas, when you choose to trust in God, I mean, a uh, God with the character that we normally ascribe to God, you know, I mean, power and love and kindness and graciousness and kindness and goodness and wisdom, understanding, joy, peace, hope, you know, everyone, the man in the street knows the list of attributes of God if God existed. <laughs> unless you feel he does, then you're not powered by such. And therefore you're fighting a, a horrendous battle. The whole point of the horrendous battle is that it causes you to know in your heart what is good, which both these individuals do. You know, if you ask them what was good, they'd be much clearer than even the man in the street. They could explain it very well too. But they don't feel that there is a God that's supporting them in this way. So they don't have the power, the energy, the drive, the fuel that should be carrying them on a way. They're fighting an endless battle. And their face says they haven't won yet. 
Whereas the person of hope in God, especially in the sort of Jesus way where you see God as your heavenly dad, a person of that sort of hope and assurance has arrived before the journey is taken. He's already in the kingdom of heaven. So, it's, it's sad in a way, and it's not that they don't have much good intention. But it's inadequate, which is such a shame, isn't it? Because in many ways, they are such a blessing. But they keep us focused on the wrong solution. The solution is a good effort, quite brilliant effort, and indicates that they're children of God be able to do so much with such a handicap as not knowing God. They need rescue. Thank you, Dad. Well, I have a friend who is um, a very earnest um, Buddhist. I mean, very earnest. And I've been listening to his talks, his teachings, roughly one a week, or meditations. The past was seven or eight years, could be more. And he's not budged an inch, of course. I mean, he really wouldn't listen to me anyway. He knows I'm Christian, not Buddhist. He knows how I'm receiving much of what he says. He doesn't give up. But of course, nor do I. <laughs> and in a sense, I must win because I got God on my side. But, um, haven't we all? No, he hasn't, you see. This is the whole point. When you're a Buddhist, there's no God. In fact, there's no self, would you believe it? God, dear. Um, and I mean, he's, he's as old as I am, and he's not going to live that much longer. Uh, one can only hope that in his understanding of things, his next um, incarnation is equally fanatical, but in a religion that at least has God. I suspect it's going to be a fundamentalist God, that's the frightening thing. And uh, he'll go through another lifetime of... Um, furiously barking up the wrong tree. Um, as a fun tragic fundamentalist and die accordingly. But then perhaps, especially in his present understanding, that would just mean another incarnation in a rather improved religion next time. And so on. <laughs> I don't know. Um, he's a good friend. We're good friends to each other. And so I hope that and trust that instinctively you'll be drawn to whatever next life or situation he has after this one. Be drawn to something that him open to the love of God as his dad. That's what he needs. As I understand it, you, 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 you understand. He needs to know the love of God. Same with Marshall Rosenberg. He knows love 
but he doesn't see it as of God. Same with Krishnamurti. The Theosophy Society, of course, couldn't furnish him with the love of God. It didn't have it in its purse. It had enormous help and loving kindness from some of the members and devotion. But it wasn't enough, and he knows it wasn't enough. So he went out as a philosopher instead of a saint. Because sainthood wasn't on the menu, but understanding and philosophy was. So he became a world leading 20th century philosopher. Amazing chap, but not happy. Tragically, an amazing chap. Bless him. And I'm sure he's blessed. And God is for us. Who can stand against us, not even ourselves? In the end, we turn to God. Because God is the beginning and the end of all things. reason for living. And there is none beside. You can adopt many other views. You can pretend at being a philosopher, pretend at being a great humanitarian crusader, pretend many, many reasons for living, but they will all let you down because you need God. And it's the way God has designed this universe of the transitory so that in the end you know that what you really need is Him, His loving kindness and goodness. Love you, Dad. <laughs>